Welcome back to the Medieval Talk. Welcome back to the Talk Past podcast here on the Medieval Content Channel. Uh, today we're going to talk about medieval shields throughout history, from of course the original occurrence to about the 1500s. And uh, with me again is Colin. So hello there. Hey, how you doing? I'm well enough. And let's let's delve. So obviously, first let's start at the earliest occurrence of shields, which I think is around the Bronze Age. Um, that is one of the earlier times when shields started up, because let's face it, at that point, armor hadn't advanced much. It was mostly mm -hmm. linen, maybe leather, so it was easily sliced a bit. So you come up with a solid wood board, put a handle on it, voila, shield. Exactly. It's the earliest means of defense. It's also one of the, the most efficient and we're still using shields to this day. You know, like SWAT teams. Different material, but same shape. Indeed, um, indeed. And um, then over time, you get progression of shields. Initially, they were just for the individual protection. Mm -hmm. When you get into the classical Greek for time period, yep. and this will also come into the gr medieval times as well, you get uh, when shields are seen as a protection for the community in general. Because they saw armor as your personal protection, the shield was the protection of the community and the phalanx. Exactly. And of course, this type of defense alone is is a pretty much wide reaching across the globe. Uh, you know, not just uh, the Americas with the natives, but uh, you know, Europe, uh, our yeah. particular medieval area, which you know, Scotland, Ireland, England, but also you know, France and through yeah. exactly. Yeah, and. Um... As we go on with shields now, you got the Roman period, and after Rome, you have the Dark Arch Ages, where we really start to get into, a little after that, what we call the Medieval mm -hmm. Period. And uh, a lot of shields then were round, because, well, the Romans had started oh, yeah. going from their scutum to a more oval-shaped shield. Mm -hmm. Even the Byzantines, for the longest time, were still using an oval-shaped shield. Yeah. I've got a small okay. list of uh, Roman shields, and I'm sure I'm going to butcher some of the names. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, obviously they had the Citratus, which is their light shield. Uh, the yep. Clippius, the large the oval shield. Mm -hmm. um, the one you see common in the later Roman period and, like I said, mm -hmm. early Byzantine periods. Yep, the Parmela, which is another small light shield. Uh, the Parmela, the Parma Equestris. Don't worry, uh, I'm butchering some of these myself. Mm-hmm. Medium size round cavalry shield. Cavalry, of course, we need to discuss that too, because for horses, they yeah, definitely had shields too. Absolutely, and wow. it dictated the grip so that you'd have on a shield, like more often than mm -hmm. not a cavalryman's shield, especially in the medieval period, usually had that two point grip or it had that shoulder strap. Whereas most infantry yep. shields, yes, the larger ones would have a two point grip too, but in the earlier periods, you had a lot of that center grip. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you mentioned the scutum. Um, the large rectangular one, it's got the divots or the indents on both sides that are going down. Absolutely. So we'll obviously discuss in terms of how features of shields were used. It's one point to also take in that the shield was not just an item purely for defense, as we see. It was also an aggressive weapon. It's a blunt object. I mean, even if it's not going to kill, it staggers your opponent. Like um, the pugnum. Um, the small shield, which was used for thrusting. Absolutely. And the small um, shield was used for thrusting. Even the big Viking shields, you could punch with that that thing and cause quite a bit of damage. Um, have you ever watched uh, Thane Thrand on YouTube? Uh, I, no. No. I'm not familiar. Well, I'm probably going to mention a couple of these uh, mm -hmm. YouTube videos, and a lot of them do yeah. some really good work. They show some really good, good stuff, and they know their things. Like, there's the Metatron, there's Knight Errands, there's there's Scalagra, M. Lindy Burge, Todd's Workshop. These guys put a lot of research into it. They do a lot of work, and they know their stuff. And yes, I'm referring to YouTubers. I also, <laughs> and I've read some of the books as well. So there's mm -hmm. that as well. Yep. Um, I, not to name drop, I'm obviously, whatever. Um, but I watch uh, Modern History TV, yeah. which. Modern History is a good one, too. Mm -hmm. uh, Scalagram as well. And uh, the occasional shad, shad adversity. <laughs> yeah, shad. Um, beyond that, I've got a few sort of uh, obscure channels, but some of them are more of people dressing up 
in the style of medieval history, whether it's armor, whether it's clothing, uh, and then a few others are more just kind of doing stuff uh, from that period and sort of just trying it out. Again, Absolutely. those ones are more like uh, in Germany and, and, and Norway and stuff, so I don't really know the names of the channels. Mm, yeah, I'm with you on that account. <laughs> yeah, but uh, predominantly modern history and schologram is what I'll watch. Uh, if not specifically searching for certain things. Like I was recently, and this is a small uh, digress, but I'll go right back in, but learning about the astroglabe hmm. and basically flat disks that were effectively like flattened globes uh, that was oh. used to map the stars, uh, the universe, or, or, or at least our solar system that they knew at the time. So yeah, little, that's always little, a pretty good thing. Little digresses of stuff like that. But uh, let's <laughs> let's start with, the Vikings and the Scandinavians, because of course, oh, a little bit of my background. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's that's the one that most people know about. Besides the typical uh, shields from the 1500s that knights wore, but uh, of course the round shields were the most basic. Uh, round shield was probably the basic one, of the more easier, more recognizable designs. Goes back a long period of time. Vikings would make their shields out of, and the Saxons too, because let's face it, mm -hmm. other than a few minor differences, they were basically the same people. Exactly. Just one was settled in England for a bit longer than the other. Yeah. And, and of course, the shields on this channel's uh, de design, when we're talking, are uh, incorrect, mildly, but uh, Viking shields. I say incorrect in the sense that obviously there's more to them just wood. That would be on the shield. People don't know that. People don't know that this more raw height covering on the outside as well, which really gave it some of its strength. And the wood just gave it the shape, but the raw height gave it the strength to resist arrows and other weapons while keeping the wood from totally breaking apart. The reason exactly. why they chose things like linden wood and say like poplar and later times was mm -hmm. it didn't split easily. I mean, yeah, would break along the lines, but it wouldn't split and splinter very easily. So they were popular wood choices, not to mention they were light. And so if exactly. you're going to be carrying this thing around for a while, you don't want it to be too heavy. But you still want that strength in there. So you have something like rawhide or anything, kind of like leather or other material that you're going to put over there to give it some real strength. Yeah, people don't typically see that. Um, but, you know, we... we... Some of us that did the Viking uh, year, of course, I was on the Saxon side, so exclude me on that part. But <laughs> we were both uh, on the Saxon side. Let's face right. it. Right. Oh so. yeah, yeah. But um, of course, some of some of them, including my partner that played Guthrum, made their own shields with as best as they could the appropriate materials. But there's yeah, a lot the, that actually goes into it. There's a whole and lot then, that goes into it. You got to treat the material. Right, mm -hmm. you gotta set the planks right. You even gotta put a rim on the thing, and sometimes the rim would be leather. Other times that would be an actual metal rim, especially if it was like yeah. a Guthrum who was to be a jarl. That mm -hmm. was another sign of wealth. Was looking at the shield. Exactly. I mean, they'd all have designs, but look at the rim. If it's got a metal rim, this is obviously someone who has money who can put that on his shield and thus reduce the cutting capability of axes and swords into that edge, which is the exactly. most likely place it's going to be hit. Although, of course, um, shields were also meant to break uh, some of those. You know, the wood, I know, I remember the wood was thinly cut so that you had a little bit more pieces on there. And some of them were meant to break because it, when you're in war, you, an axe, a sword, dagger, a sax, whatever is going to get stuck in there. And you just, you move on, get another one, or you, you just go from there with the, whatever your uh, dominant weapon is. Exactly, like... um. Shields, if an uh, enemy's weapon gets trapped in there, that's perfect. So if you're, what, you might lose that shield. You got another one back home. But he's without a weapon. You've still got yours. Okay. You have an edge there. And even though, yes, I say the shield can be used as a blunt weapon, between the choice, choice of having a shield or an axe in a hand, I think I'm going to want to have my axe still and lose the shield. Well, yeah. So that way you, you are able to disarm your opponent. And you still have your weapon um, exactly. in the instance where the shield would break beyond repair, which, of course, um, let's discuss in terms of the Viking shield. Obviously, on the channel design, uh, we've got a metal boss on the front. Mm -hmm. um, in the early ages, there were a lot of bosses um, of, of usually metal, iron. It, it was a... 
good punching source, and there's also a form of hand protection as well because exactly some that's where the handle would was. get would get penetrated by certain weapons. Not always, but they would. But mm -hmm. your hand would be protected if one goes straight in. And the way you'd hold the shield a lot of times is not to always have your arm flat up against it, even yeah, no. in the shield wall, so that if something did go through, it's not going to then ram into your arm. Exactly. You want uh, angles. You want your, your bones, your muscles to be angled, whether you're standing, whether you're holding anything. So that way, considering if it's a shield wall, uh, the force coming in isn't going to press against that straight line of bone and flesh. It's going to press in and then you can push back. Uh, but of course, that is where you would have had your hand. Uh, this changes mm -hmm. throughout history and we'll go over that. But um, and, and I would have loved to once once able to to do um, manuscript fighting and test all of this out practically. But also, mm -hmm. of course, uh, an iron boss would be good for deflecting. Absolutely. I mean, the round shape, it is a good deflecting surface. And the other thing is what people miss about shields is, yes, even if these weapons can penetrate it, if you're attacking the shield, you're not attacking the person behind it. You want to attack the person behind it and avoid exactly. the shield. A lot of people, uh, if you will, for the take the phrase, go for the eyes. So in this sense, the eye would be your shield whether it's the boss or as a design or just a shield itself, because that's what the, you know what's present immediately before your uh, opponent. But really, if you had any smarts or the best weapon that you could use to do this, you'd want to move the shield, tuck under uh, or reach over, or when they're just any means that you can get rid of that, that shield or use it against the opponent. Exactly. You don't, don't want to be attack, attacking it, but that's what you see a lot of people do. They'll attack the shield, or they'll try to beat the shield. Mm -hmm. Easiest thing to do is actually to get around the shield. Yep. Yeah, and if you can't, like I said, try to try to get disarm that shield. Obviously, one way is an axe through the shield or, or something. Um, obviously, you don't want to do that. You don't want to lose your weapon. No, you don't want to lose your weapon. If it's uh, in a scenario where, you know, back then... The sword was more of a defensive weapon, or you had maybe you had two weapons on you, like a sword, an axe, and usually people had the pole arm as their main weapon. Pole arms were I mean, a very popular main weapon, and that's the thing that a lot of people also miss. And you actually hit it on swords. I don't realize. Yeah, swords are basically your sidearm. It's your pistol. It's not your yeah. rifle. It's your mace. You know, it's, it's the secondary. Secondary weapon. Um, primary would be your, your pole arm. So there you have distance, but if you just can't get through an opponent and that's that's your target, then well hopefully you've got a pole arm that has uh points, you know, that <laughs> yes. you can you can hook onto. Uh but uh, beyond that, well I mean if you have a pole arm, oh there you go, who cares? Just keep your distance. But uh beyond that, uh the boss, of course, over time, uh, as we hop over to England. Ireland and Scotland began to uh, disappear. So yeah, eventually we start seeing a change in things. For example, even though the Saxons are still using the shield wall, they've had some encounter with the Normans, and they're starting to move over to the more kite-shaped shield, mm -hmm. which was more of a cavalryman's shield. As you're riding in, you can angle that shield, point down, protect a part of your horse from the side yep. you're expecting to be attacked from. And when you're riding away, like in the bio tapestry, now some of this stuff is some theories I have, but if somebody's throwing weapons at you, like say throwing axes, whatever, you can throw that point behind you, hold it like you see them holding it, and that extension now is protecting your back. Yeah, exactly. And uh, there in the bio tapestry, there's actually a dis not a description; it's a it's a print, but there is a design that is showing people that are wearing or, or utilizing shields with bosses and shields yeah. without. And the boss hadn't fully gone out by the time of like mm -hmm. the normal. But they're the same happen. shield just with or without a boss. I think mm -hmm. that is sort of a, kind of a snapshot of generations. Here, of course, we, we see that more subtly 
and we kind of notice it after the fact. But you know, technology today uh, is if it's a fad, then it's, it's not what I'm talking about. But something like phones that were once these giant hulking devices <laughs> that you had to have hooked to the wall, then they were giant hulking devices that you didn't have to. Um, the first mobile ones, you know, then they got smaller, then they got smaller, then they're flip phones, and then now they're getting bigger and bigger. Now they're like literal computers. Same thing. Um, there, there were probably were people of the older generation that still had the boss because that's what they grew up with. Even and then though... the newer ones are like, Ugh, I don't need a boss. I got, I got this, this new design, and this will got... be fine. Why do I need a boss when it's for the center grip to protect my hand? I mean, I'm mm -hmm. using a two-point grip, and I got this shoulder strap, so when I'm not using the grip, I throw it on my back. And... Right. Of course, the detriment of the newer design is that you don't have the boss to protect you. So exactly. if something goes through, it could go through your arm. Exactly, but um, sometimes what they do to protect this arm, again, some of this is me theory crafting now i watched todd's workshop mm -hmm. where he shoots arrows through um the shield and it's like yeah it's going to go into your arm yeah. but at that point they've got padding there you'd probably reinforce that section of your shield with some extra padding now not on the front but probably on the back end of it so that there's more material to go through before it hits your arm right but by the um, same the, the biggest problem they had back then i think in terms of all of these battles is one, their weapons were very crude, very crudely made or poorly made, we'll say. Mm -hmm. So the fact that so many people died in battle to simple flesh wounds like that, where even even you just had a, a, a light nick, uh, shows how like horrible their medicine was. Because I mean, yeah. now we've got we've got really fine tuned, perfected uh, weapons that back then. They'd have just decimated everybody with, and I'm just talking about swords and shields and daggers and stuff. Us, we perfected the medieval weapons, but uh, yeah, back then, all weapons have a basis in things. But it's kind of like how you mentioned on the medical tech. Medical tech, even through history, has shown to usually lag behind our ability to kill each other. Right. So, of course, how that relates to this, you know, if if you get cut, or or if an axe, sword, arrow, whichever spearhead is getting through that shield that doesn't have a boss that's you know made of some sort of metal usually iron uh or it probably oh, have an iron backing on it mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. it's not going to be seen because as we see in later times they want to decorate their shields more but they're not exactly. going to put too much metal on the thing because again you Heavy. still want it light you still want it movable yeah which uh, of course otherwise you know if you hook a bearded axe underneath that and you can get right into that flesh well that's all well, there you go and then that'll, yep. however, delve into the various uh, sizes and means and shapes of shields. Of course, yep. it began with the round shield. It began with the round shield. Then as you see, when people start moving on to horseback riding, we see the kite shield coming more into mm -hmm. play. Now as we start armoring the rider up more, because beforehand he's dressed like any of the infantrymen at the time, a yep. ha hauberk that's probably hanging down to his knees, maybe a little below. Oh, it's the sleeves ending uh, a certain point. And so he's got that big shield to protect him, but it gives some protection to the horse as well. But as exactly. we move forward in time, we see them starting to abandon the kite shield and going to a, uh, well, when you were mounted cavalrymen, the smaller heater shield. Grip was sa still the same. They removed the shoulder strap that went around the neck, so you can't sling the thing on your back now. But the rider's got more armor on him, and we see the start of, in some cases, early barding. They start putting some chain mail and cloth covering over the horses. So yeah. now the shield is not there so much to protect the horse. It is just another item for the rider. And a lot of people are like, well, why'd they get rid of the shoulder strap? Uh, because you still need a hand on the reins. But I think what a lot of people miss, and I've read in like books, say, The Medieval Knight, uh, so in cavalry archers like the Mongols and others, you see these guys who are dropping the reins and either shooting arrows or, in the case of, like I said, certain knights, they're dropping the reins and fighting with their weapons. And they're like, but how do they control the horse? These guys learn to control the horse with just their legs. Yeah. 
So it's like, yeah, you're not using the reins. You're just using your legs to tell the horse what to do. So, I mean, in a lot of cases, and of course, you can you can find ways to be comfortable with your equipment, your weapons on the horse. But of course, a lot of the time, you have a hand that's on a on a weapon, usually a pole arm, of course, and you've got possibly a shield, possibly other stuff that your hands are just kind of they're they're holding the reins, but they're not really able to take the rein. So, I mean, you've got you've got feet, you've got legs, yeah. you've got your weapon. Um, there, there are ways to to handle the horse, and we'll discuss that in a, a separate podcast. Yeah, a separate video. Let's face it, this smaller heater shields now. It's got a light enough weight you can swing that thing around to get it to the positions mm-hmm. to block, and you're holding it out from your body again. Something goes through it, so it doesn't hit hit you. You've probably got some reinforcing along the point where your arm runs. Yep, and of course, always slant it at an angle. Every time you uh, slant that thing at an angle, and if you're going to meet a strike with it, and that's the thing that a lot of people do, you don't just stand there and let the strike hit that shield with full force. That shield shoots out, and it meets the strike before it hits it, the power swing, thus stopping your opponent's weapon, and then you swing in. Right, and it's hard to to help visualize for anyone listening that don't do what we do. Um, yeah, I suppose uh, one of these days I'll have to throw stuff on, put yeah. a, strap a shield to my arm and show how it's like that shield goes out meets the strike yeah and it's still eventually, in front of you but it meets the strike yeah eventually on the channel we'll go back to live action you know combat and other medieval uh practical testing um but you know uh, to help perhaps best visualize it you know when you're holding it your your hand has very little movement you basically have up down and out and back so yep. some things up, like down. a buckler you've got you've got your rotation of course, because the buckler is small. Yeah, well, the buckler um, is basically the boss of the big shields, just enlarged a little bit. Now, I don't note only a little bit, not a whole lot, so it covers yeah. quite a bit more. But, um, you know, when, when you're taking a strike, or even just, just in a defensive stance, you want uh, angled, your, your body, your arm is angled, so that, again, you're not taking a straight pressure yeah. to your bones. <laughs> But also the shield is angled because, again... You want to glance off. Exactly. Especially if you have a boss. Uh, Same reason why lances will glance off the round heads of a knight's helm. Uh, Mm -hmm. But you want that angled so that one, yeah, you can glance it, but you can also deflect it. You can parry. You can just skip it all together if you just want to step aside. But that is really the best way of of allowing the momentum of your opponent Mm -hmm. to best utilize the appropriate defensive and strategy of a shield. Again, going back to right. all the shield designs and all, they're not just a defensive weapon, like I, I've been saying, they're mm-hmm. also a blunt offensive weapon. You hit somebody in the right place, even with a lightweight shield, you get enough velocity behind it, you can, and you hit at the right spot, you can still kill a person with it. It is not by no means just a, well, let me hide behind this thing. No, it's a extra weapon on your arm not your primary exactly. weapon but it's a secondary weapon it's like that uh say it's like a well let's go with it in a modern term right now we mentioned the mace says like your sidearm or your pistol sidearm mm-hmm. let's say this is like um well let's do it like this it's a blunt uh, like, weapon yeah it's a blunt, blunt weapon. weapon say like a bag or a per- hammer purse Bag of groceries, a purse, any of those things with a lot of stuff in it where no one expects anything, and then you swing that at somebody, it's going to hurt when it's yeah. got some weight to like, it. Uh, like your elbow. Yeah, you your elbow. One of your elbow. That's probably a bit more appropriate, I guess, because it has probably. the same sort of range of motion. <laughs> Let's face but... it. With the two-point grip, what you're basically doing is an elbow strike. Mm-hmm. Only your impact area with that edge is a lot smaller. And yeah. if you've got a metal rim on that thing, which, let's face it, yep. if you were rich, you were going to have a metal rim, it's going to do a lot of damage. Exactly. And then, of course, um, I've got a diagram of shields throughout history. Of course, they're not labeled, though, but um, uh, in terms of shapes. But, of course, well, you know, obviously, circle, and then the heater, yeah. or the quote-unquote teardrop. Yeah, the heater looks most... like that basic knightly shield that everyone mm-hmm. thinks about. It's most prevalent. 
But uh, Tides looks like an upside down teardrop. Yep. But there's also uh, spiked shields. There were shields that were specifically made for jousting um, yeah. or showing off. You know, the so those shield would have been heavily reinforced. Probably had mm-hmm. be a heavier design, so it's going to weigh a bit more. Because you don't in the days when you're still wearing chainmail or maybe a coat of plates on your chest, you don't want that lance hitting you in the chest. You want it to hit the shield. So the shield yeah. is much more reinforced. It's heavier. It is meant to take a blow. And yeah, it would probably stop up any kind of weapon at the time. Now, yeah. You still had the occasional accident and they took the tips off, but it reduced it a bit. Yeah, and then of course those ones specifically had the indentation or the lance, um, usually up in uh, the middle. Yeah, they had that little corner, corner spots cut out so yep, you can rest your exactly. lance on top of it. So those, those are more decorative, but they also had practical use. So they were still protecting someone from something, even yep. if jousting, though dangerous, was meant for sport back then. Sport, wow. and it was also practice for war. Mm-hmm. Because the first thing you need to do as a cavalryman is charge in. So it was teaching you to take the hit, if you were going to take a hit, and to deliver a hit. It's like jousting yeah. at the, or riding at Quintain. Exactly. Oh, only the uh, other person's riding back against you. Yeah. And, you know, of course, there's, there's other shields elsewhere, you know, in Africa. Uh, oh, yeah. Like, Italy. Um, and, and Italy Asia. Was still China, always Japan. big on, like, the round shield for good periods of time. Though mm-hmm. More of a two point. Point grip. They still used a heater and other. Shield designs common about yeah. Europe. And um, like I said, the Byzantines, big time into like the oval shape because they still called themselves Romans, even though in Europe they wouldn't do that. And then we get mm-hmm. to like the Middle East where we have a lot more metal shields, but the shield size is also a little smaller. Of course, uh, kite shield on the Bay of Tapestry. Um, heater shields we've been talking about, buckler the, the pavis, which are wall shields. Oh, yeah, the and... pavis. That's a tall shield. That's meant for you to place that on the ground. And that thing is heavily reinforced because it's meant to yep. stop arrows and all from going through it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's specifically for crossbowmen, which, mm-hmm. of course, I think over the course of time, shields became less about defending the infantry and more about defending your crossbowmen. Yeah, they did more become about defending your crossbowmen or missile troops in general from opposing missiles. And let's not get into the... uh, Another shield type that a lot of people miss is the large-sized heater that was used by infantry in the High Middle Ages. I mean, we all look at the standard heater that the knights used, but there's also that large, what I call a war heater. This is one Mm -hmm. that's used by the infantry, and it's meant to be large because a lot of times the infantry at this age were mostly in... Very light armor, so that shield was, harkening back to the Roman times, primarily meant for protection. And, and of course, uh, to divulge from shape and uh, defense, uh, quickly talk about things that we would put on our shields. Because, uh, of course, each shield, for the most part, would have been personalized to the person or the house. So that's where you would also paint your... Family uh, colors. Heraldry. Yep, your heraldry. And your, your shield symbols. Uh, mm-hmm. We'll delve deep into a heraldry podcast episode. But just to quickly notate, of course, you know, all the the colors were supposed to be like gems, you know, like or argent, jewels, azure, sable, vert, etc. There was also a little unofficial rule that they tried to make things stand out. Now, it didn't always follow this, but yeah, this was like something I learned in my times doing some uh, historical reenactment. You tried to avoid what they called colors and metal-based colors. Metals yeah. were like uh, gold, yellow, white, and silver. Mm-hmm. And your standard colors were like red, green, blue, black. You tried yeah. to not have those overlapping because if you had white and, say, gold, a lot of times the symbol, you couldn't see it from a distance. Right. I mean, normally, obviously, you have a variety of patterns, and we'll delve into that deeper another time. Yeah. But, of course, you know, you have the colors which were either a gem or a metal or both. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, your, your heraldry there. And often the shield would also act as, I guess, a sort of calling card. If a you want to call it that. Card, Something of, a, of an identifier. Because sometimes shield... Your flag. Yeah, it was your flag. Or, say, who you worked for's flag. Like, 
let's take a, an example. Say I'm like a knight bachelor. I'm not even a knight banneret. I don't even get to wear my own colors on my shield. So I'm wearing my lord's colors. And let's say you're my lord, because let's face it, you were my king at one point. Right, like um, Alfred and his subjects, sort of, or, or yeah. whomever, King Henry, Well, let's say Alfred was in the high Middle Ages, because at the time... Of like the Vikings, mostly what was done was say religious symbols or yep. symbols to beseech uh, the gods of the Vikings or seek their protection, that sort of thing. But personal symbols, let's say Alfred and the high, let's say high like Middle 15th Ages. century, yeah, say 15th century, where he's got his own device. Let's give him a dragon as his device. I don't know, say a gold dragon with a black background. That might be someone's actual device, but it just seemed to fit right now. That's yeah. what I think of them. I think Saxons. Of course, and they were they Let's were say you're Alfred. Let's say I'm just one of your retainers. I'm going out there, and I'd be carrying that symbol on my shield, even though my symbol might be a white lion with a blue background. But mm -hmm. because I'm sworn to your house, and I haven't earned the right to carry my own symbol on my shield or my own banner, I will have your symbol on my shield so that when people see me come into a place, they know that it's not me meaning business, it's you meaning business. It's, it's this person's army. Yeah. Or his representative, whatever. Yep. Indeed. And, uh, of course, I mean, we, I, mean I, don't, eh, I guess we still do that today. Maybe less so. Obviously, we, we do that. But I'm talking about, like, practical stuff you'd see in, in like, yeah, you know, SWAT and police. They don't really do that. Yeah, but, no, um, I'm... Back then, it was a lot more colorful, a lot more vibrant, and mm -hmm. you know, shields were were not just made of wood. Yeah, shields were metal. made of a number of materials, and um, when they in the medieval period, especially the high period, they liked to use a cloth covering on the front to be able to paint it more easily, so they could get more vibrant colors. They could get more vibrant and symbolism on it, of which we discussed. However, uh, one thing to note. So I recently went back and watched, and I mentioned this in the Game of Thrones podcast, but I'm going to mention it here because it's relevant. Okay. So uh, in the scene, just the beginning, episode one, where we're starting to see people in Winterfell, and I don't mm -hmm. just mean main characters, I mean the people of Winterfell, uh, as they're getting ready to leave to follow the king back to his... King's Landing. Mm -hmm, his kingdom. Uh, there's a couple of people specifically of Winterfell uh, infantry, of whom look like they are using a pure metal shield with the direwolf on it. Mm -hmm. And they're not like these buff, muscular mountain men. Mountain referring to the character of the mountain. Mm -hmm. They're just these people like you and I with these intensely, what looks like titanium, obviously at that time of frame, it would be like iron shields. And I'm like, that seems awfully... It, it, incorrect yeah those shields for like um that you see the north wearing using mm -hmm. those me metal ones that was a lot more common to see metal shields like that amongst say um the Saracen, turkish even indian forces of the time because they had a lot of metal in their shields some of them were pure metal some of them had metal on the front with that rich decoration now not yeah. in the dire wolf's head but they mm -hmm. were richly decorated too oh yeah um, and of course, I mean, our shields... But they were also we, a little smaller in size. They were not... Yeah, because, I mean, the ones in Game of Thrones that you see being used in Winterfell are massive. They are like the Viking shields. That That's yeah. how big they look. Um, and that's just way too much metal, especially if it's iron. Yeah, and, I wouldn't be wasting that much metal. Like I said, if I was to use any metal on the shield, it would be the rim and probably... Between where the padding and the actual shield was on a wooden one, say a heater, along that line where my arm's going to be. Or if it's around a boss. Exactly. Um, of course, when we use metal for our shields, we, of course, tend to utilize kite shields that are metal. The ones we have are obviously they're not iron. They're not the kind we, of metal you're going to get back then, but yeah, we they're, they're paper thin. They are thin, but they're made out of a lot of modern day materials. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, when we use it, we're thinking on safety purposes because we don't need a shield breaking yeah. or having a weapon go through and stab somebody in the arm. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the main purpose that some of the people that have those using those is for sound. Exactly. Because... I mean, the audience loves hearing uh, the sound of a weapon smashing against that metal shield. It gives a distinct ring, and they just love hearing that. Yeah, to me, it kind of sounds like uh, when you're pulling up a, a big sheet of metal and you're wiggling it to try to emulate the sound of thunder. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what it's like when you're hitting these paper thin metal shields with any weapon but Absolutely. they do hold up yeah they do hold up and i've actually had using a wooden shield once round one of course and going two point grip on that thing i actually managed to break it one time in a fight hand grip but no way. i would Great. i would be curious to see how some of those measure up to actual medieval material weapons because remember the back then their their weapons were crudely made or poorly made if you will well a lot um, of them they would didn't... be crudely or poorly made however if you could have, as we get later on in the time maybe though... maybe not maybe not poorly made uh, i think that's the worst word to say for that i think i think crude materials made crude materials. with poor materials i mean there was a reason why spanish steel was so sought after because the carbon content was naturally higher in it which yeah produced a superior blade. Yeah. And then and granted, later, granted you want a nice how to do stuff like that and increasing the carbon content. So as we go mm-hmm. later in the medieval period, we see the weapons all of a sudden get hugely better. Yeah. And of course, now we know a, a, a nice middle range of your carbon count is the best weapon. Absolutely. They never would have reached they never would have reached that. Oh, well, there's some surprise. I mean, take for example Damascus steel. Oh, That's a, uh, yeah. Pull that up. Although, of course, when I talk, I'm, I'm referring to like England. Oh uh, yeah, the uh, England does make sense, but the way I look at the medieval period, it's more than just England. I mean, yeah, England's the one that we focus on the most yeah. because that's where most of our background comes from. But there's so much more to it than there. You got France, you got Spain, Germany, China, Scandinavia, China, Japan, and all these places had a medieval period. Now, yes, England, as time went on, as we go into like the high Middle Ages, they start to get better weapons. They're not as crudely made anymore. When we get into the late medieval periods, they're really well made. That's why, of course, you see people using less and less of chainmail and more and more of plate armor exactly. as you get into solid, the later periods. Solid plate armor, and this is why I get the feeling that some of the uh, like the shields, even though they were made of wood, probably had maybe a slight metal backing to, along the line where your arm would be. It is because they said that it was the equivalent of no longer wearing a shield on your body, on your arm, I should say, but wearing the shield on your body. Mm-hmm. Of course, once once firearms were brought into brought into the field, of course, which was started in the medieval period as well, very very late medieval. Um, very late then medieval. plate is just out of the picture. Well, so it's not yeah. out of the picture yet. Plates not completely been treated but, better but... to become bulletproof, but it's the refinement of firearms and it's the introduction of professional soldiers. I mean, it's a lot cheaper to train. 200 soldiers than it is to train two knights. I'm using that as a equivalent cost thing. Exactly, because knights had more than just the knight. You had their house and then their, and the people that are under them, besides just to their train family. Him, you had to equip him, you had to equip his retainers, or men-at-arms who are probably similarly trained and are just as dangerous in combat, and you gotta equip them, you gotta give them horses, you gotta feed their horses, you gotta feed them, I mean, it just took so much to maintain this small force of maybe, let's say, five knights and 20 men at arms, as compared to several hundred professional soldiers whom you can give these firearms to. And as the firearms got more refined, aka they're firing more accurately, they're able to reload faster, they're yeah. shooting at a higher velocity. Now, then, uh, quick digress, but um, what is your favorite shield design? 
I have a soft spot for the heater. I've fought with one of those for quite a while, and I just like the fact that, I don't know, it feels right on my arm. Mm -hmm. I like, like the fact that because it's not a full square, it doesn't snag on your leg when you have to swing yeah. it to, from one position to the other. It's not as long down as the kite, so I lose some protection for the legs, but that's one of the reasons why I like wearing... I'm a personal favorite of the partial plate look when they were still wearing, say, like a coat of plates and chain mail, but they had the plate on their arms and their legs. And they were still using the heater then. Indeed. And of course, the heater is your... Oh, yeah, your heater is... Hmm? Sorry, I had a soda. Not a soda, but one of those bubbly things. So that's always oh, coming back bubbly. up. But um, yeah, of course, the heater is the stereotypical traditional idea of medieval shields. So, Absolutely. you know, um, that's your typical uh, straight top teardrop. Straight top um, teardrop. Usually um, from like mid-thigh to your neck and height. So it just feels like a good balance between being able to be defensive with that thing while still maintaining enough mobility and agility to fight. I can still move that thing in to block. And the reason why I like having the plate on my arms and legs is then if it's a shield made out of, say, uh, poplar, but it doesn't have that metal backing where my arm runs, I still got that plate over my arm okay. that's going to protect it. Now, for me, um, I have kind of like a 50% smaller version of the Viking shield. And mm -hmm. then I also have a small, uh, pure metal buckler. So I think for me, I would say the Viking shield with a boss, but smaller. Because, you know, I'm, I'm like five, six, five, seven on a good day. So <laughs> using a Viking shield about the size of me is not going to work. But... Um, mine, which is about 50%, although it doesn't have a boss. Um, I like that. It's it's that sort of classic early medieval, which I prefer. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I like that sort of uh, zero to 900 period uh, for me. That's that's medieval. Whereas and, me, I like uh, that period of uh, the later, like yeah. 1250 up to uh, 1380. Yeah. I like the 1300s as well, um, but I don't delve as much into later than that um aside from talking about like plate and such but yeah i would say probably yeah. the viking shield but smaller um uh, or or maybe just no shield because obviously you know me i usually like to do hand to hand yeah, i've seen um, that plenty yeah. whereas me i like um, to as you know throw on as much armor shields whatever i can and take a few yeah. hits occasionally as well yeah when we're choreographing combat i like to do hand to hand if not just a dagger um, and then, or at, I don't know. I mean, I like using a sword, but even just an axe would be fine. Something that's, I like that sort of, uh, I don't want to say brutal, but martial combat, just, just hand to hand, just something where you're in measure and you're, you're able to emphasize emotion with uh, your yes. body isolations and your actions and acting, um, as opposed no. to, um, although I do love to, having a full full on later medieval setup with with sword shield armor and that which looks great and is amazing to feel when you're doing it but i like well, the nitty gritty yeah that's one of the things i like is i like people being able to look and see this uh thing where it's like two warriors fully decked out going at it with weapons and in mm -hmm. their own martial way i mean you can't see their faces you can't see the reactions you can see isolations that are allowed within the kit but it really gives you an idea on even though it's show purposes in some cases it gives you an idea on man these guys were dangerous even in that tank that they're wearing and now oh, yeah. going back to shields again there was one thing i forgot to throw down and yeah. it's also the size of the shield you got to take that into account Mm -hmm. For example, um, now the Viking shield, like you mentioned, normally that was a good shield for both individual and unit combat because you could either form the shield wall with it and there you have a unit, or it was very good due to its center grip for individual combat. Sometimes, like the large-sized heater, this is why we got two sizes of heaters. The 
more nightly heater, the size that I'm talking about, where it's not all that big. It's like what you'd call a medium-sized shield. Yep. Great for individual combat. It's great for combat from horseback. Back. Exactly. Not so no. good in unit combat because you can't get that overlap. And trust me, I've tried being in a shield wall with one of those shields. Doesn't really exactly. work. Don't protect now let's enough. Let's delve as a final topic into that specific uh, tactic because we haven't as of yet. Uh, shield walls. Of course, we did one, but we were acting. Um, but shield walls have been a thing for a very... Uh, sorry for creaking. I have a creaky chair. But shield walls have been a thing since long before it's been, the medieval period. Been think, well, obviously, you got the Roman Empire. In fact, you can say the first shield wall was the original Greek phalanx. That was... Yes. It was a shield wall. Yep. And um, the, the Persian were, Sparabara. Oh, yeah, Persian Sparabara. They would form a shield wall, and archers would shoot over them. So even before the Greeks, you have that shield wall. I suppose I should probably attribute it to the Persians because their tactic literally called for a shield wall. Yes, a lot of other groups had tightly packed infantry, but the shields didn't always work for a shield wall. But the Mm Sparabara actually had a large enough shield that could serve in a shield wall. And all they to do is plant those shields, lock the wall, let the archers do the work. When the enemy engaged the shield wall, cavalry fall on the flanks. Yep. And of course, we should note, and we'll, we'll showcase this when we get back to live filming, because I want to do, I would say I want to showcase what we do theatrically, but also mm-hmm. really specifically get into actual medieval manuscripts. But um, there was more than just one layer to the wall. Uh, we yeah. did one layer because we're actors, and... People in reality, we only have so much. And but I've been in shield walls before. It would be a layered effect, like um, your front line would be guys with simple hand weapons, axes, swords. Mm-hmm. Whole thing is just to deflect weapons, stay alive. If you see an opening, go for it. Second line still got shields, but they're wielding spears and they're poking yep. out. They're stabbing, but you can't reach them. And those spears are doing work. Eric, maybe after that, you've got. Axemen and again and swordsmen, then another line of spears. It's that shifting format of the line. Seals had also formations, so different variations of holding your shield wall, how it was both presented to the front, but also uh, curved. And yes. um, we'll delve into that more with live video since it's harder to yeah, describe. Yeah, that's something more subjective. But Over the podcast. Going on to shields, some shields are conducive to shield walls and formation fighting. Mm-hmm. Some are not, and some can go into both. For example, um, going back to the heater again, I'm sorry, I love the heater, but the large heaters used by the infantry, that was conducive to formation fighting in the medieval period because they could form a shield wall still, spears presenting out, and be stabbing. But you broke up that wall, or they broke formation, and that large heater didn't work too well. It's um, on the way. In the latter part, you would have had uh, uh, pike square tactics because they would have mostly had pole arms. Exactly. So, they went with the longer pole arm, got rid of the big shield because it was figured if I can poke the guy without him being able to poke at me with that lance, I'm a lot safer. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, a lot of people did them back then. Ugh. Mm-hmm. Uh, carbonated beverages. Anyway, but we also still do shield walls today. Of course, I, uh, the only reference I have that I can look at is, is besides what we do, which is, is more performance, but mm-hmm. uh, police, you know, like uh, riot shields. Oh, you know, yeah, police really do a shield wall. You can see an example some of the of old Roman-style tactics with those riot shields, and there's a reason why the riot shields look like scutums. Yep. Uh, Same scutum, thing, pretty much. The, the scutum, if you ask me, was probably one of the Best shields for formation work. I say there's nothing better than that. Yeah. Although it kind of would be funny if over the course of time, the uh, the riot shields, which resemble scutums, uh, but there are also other types, but it would be funny if they, they started to uh, evolve like medieval shields, and then you would have a, <laughs> a riot kite shield. Uh, or, or that, like that, that, right? that would be an interesting thing to see, is when the riot shields turn into kite shields. And then they fly away. But, uh, <laughs> but that, that's pretty much it. I think we've covered a 
good range of things that we can talk about uh, as uh, as a surface, well, dive. A surface dive. Obviously, we'll do a lot I'd really love deeper. to get involved in Live. using some of the things, showing some of the stuff off. Yes. I've been in a shield wall, both performance and in uh, some recreation and, well, reenactment yeah. recreation things too. So I know what it's like to be in the wall during exactly. the press. Either or. Well, we're going to talk about all of them, of course, over the course of the year. So uh, until then, I suppose. Pick one. Absolutely. I I'll will let you know. I will talk to you later and have a good night. You as well, sir. Thank you.